repeat those links for everyone. And since we're at 1102, I'll go ahead and start the introductions. For those of us still joining us, this is the cleaning medical data with our workshop, and we'll be going for the next three hours. And I'm Peter Higgins. I'm co-hosting with Crystal Lewis and Shannon Pelegi. And go ahead, you can go ahead to the next couple of slides. Uh, these materials are freely available under Creative Commons Zero versus version 1.0 universal license. Um, and maybe I should have Crystal first and then Shannon introduce themselves. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Crystal Lewis. I'm a freelance research data management consultant, and that basically means I help people learn how to wrangle, document, and share their research study data. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. I am Shannon Pledge. I'm lead data scientist at the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium. I'm also on the Our Ladies Global Leadership Team. Um, and I'll say that all of our contact information is on the main page of the website. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Mastodon, whatever else. So if you want to connect with us, definitely feel free. Okay. And I'm Peter Higgins. I am a clinician at the University of Michigan. Uh, I do uh, gastroenterology in my day job, but I spend a lot of time worrying about reproducibility of data analyses. So next slide. And we are essentially addressing the challenge of the data on the left, which people often receive in the format of Excel files, and trying to turn it into tidy data on the right, uh, as in Allison Horse illustration. And we're going to address some common problems and some common solutions and hopefully give you a workflow that you can use in attacking messy data like this. Um, after this introduction, Crystal will be talking about principles of data management. We'll have a short break at noon. Uh, Shannon will do stage one data cleaning. We'll have a short break at 12.55, and I'll finish out uh, hopefully before two o'clock to have time for questions with some stage two data cleaning. Please feel free to put questions in the Zoom chat. While one of us is talking, the other two of us will do our best to address questions in the chat. Um, and you know, at the end, we'll have the speaker available to address them as well. And the exercises are all available versus via POSIT Cloud. In the exercise instructions and in the links that are being put in the chat, you can get access to the POSIT Cloud workspace so you can code along. Uh, it's important to get that login settled before you, we get to that point of actually doing the exercises. So if you can take a minute to do that now, it's probably worth it. Otherwise, you can just watch along. And Shannon's, we're going to handle some of the next parts on syntax. Yeah, so we will have a little bit of hands-on coding. And in our coding, uh, one thing that you might see is something called the pipe operator. Uh, there was a pipe operator introduced in 2014. That's the percent greater than percent. And then more recently in 2021, there was a native R pipe introduced, which is the vertical bar with a greater than sign. So you're going to be seeing that native R pipe in our code. Um, just as for your information, in case you've never seen it, uh, Isabella Velasquez has a great blog post on it if you're not familiar with it. Um, if you click enter, um, Crystal, um, basically what the pipe does is it allows you to pass through um, a first argument into a function. So instead of saying, uh, calling some function and specifying the three arguments in order, that first argument can be moved into the top level. So you read that vertical um, greater than sign pipe as and then. So you'd read it as arg1 and then do something. Uh, so for example, on the right-hand side, instead of taking the mean of the vector 0 through 10, we're going to take the vector 0 through 10 and then compute the mean on it. Um, another example from this um, is in chapter 18 of R for Data Science. And it kind of goes into a little bit more detail about how uh, the pipe operator can make your code a little bit easier to more sequentially follow step by step. Um, so instead of having these nested statements that you see on the top, you kind of have these more um, in order statements that you see on the bottom. Another syntax thing that you will be seeing in our slides that you may or may not be familiar with is the concept of namespacing. 
So namespacing is when you use uh, two double colons to indicate a specific function within a specific package. So it's package colon colon function. So you could do dplyr colon colon select. And what that does is it tells R to explicitly use that function from that package. It can help you avoid name conflicts. For example, there's a select function in the mass package and a select function in the dplyr package. And when you do that namespacing, you don't actually require a library statement to access that function. Um, in these slides, what we have attempted to do is namespace functions that are not from tidyverse packages so that anything that's a general tidyverse function uh, will just like write out that function name. But if it requires some sort of other package installation, we've tried to namespace it. And so uh, what that would look like, um, for example, uh, for the select function is in, like on the left hand side, we're calling library dplyr and we're selecting um, mpg, the columns mpg and cylinder from the empty cars data set. So instead of doing that, we could, uh, instead of calling library dplyr, we could just say dplyr colon colon select to achieve the exact same result. Okay, thanks, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Let me just move this around real quick. Okay, um, so welcome to the first section of this workshop. We are going to spend the next 30 minutes or so reviewing some foundational principles of data management before we dive into actually writing some R code. So I imagine that many of you at some point in your career have either created or received a spreadsheet that looks like this, or maybe one that looks like this, or one that looks like this. Um, and spreadsheets formatted like this with color coding and various headers and notes throughout can be really helpful when you just need to eyeball and review some information. But at some point, you're probably going to need to actually analyze this data in some sort of statistical program, um, such as R. And if you've ever tried to read a spreadsheet like this into a program like R, then you probably felt a little like this, maybe a little defeated. Um, because you realize that while those colorful spreadsheets are formatted to be human readable, they're not necessarily formatted to be machine readable. And now you're going to have to spend hours and hours of time cleaning those spreadsheets before they can be analyzed in R. And that's what today is about. So we are going to first provide you a foundational understanding for how data should be organized for analysis purposes. We will also briefly discuss how, if at all possible, you want to correct messy data at the source. And then last, the meat of this presentation will include a review of various R functions that will help you to quickly and efficiently turn a very messy data set into a tidy and usable one. Okay. So first, we are going to talk about data organizing principles associated with four ideas. And by reviewing these principles, my hope is that we will all have this shared understanding of how data should be organized. And that understanding will help you to strategically plan for how you should wrangle those messy data sets. So we're going to talk about data structure, variable values, variable types, and missing data. So we're going to talk about data structure first. So data should make a rectangle of rows and columns. You should have the expected number of rows or cases in your data. And you should have the expected number of columns or variables in your data. And at the intersection of those rows and columns are cells filled with values. So you should have no more or no less than you expect in your data as far as rows and columns. And when I say expect, hopefully you have some idea of what, you, what should exist in your data. So either you collected the data yourself, so you have an idea, or you've been given a code book or a data dictionary that tells you what should exist in your data. So if you have extra columns in your data, that could mean that you have empty columns or unexpected variables. If you have extra rows, it could mean you have duplicate cases or empty, col or empty rows in your data. If you have less columns in your data, it could be, mean that you're missing variables, or maybe you dropped variables when you imported your data. And if you have less rows in your data, that could mean you're missing cases. And all of these things need to be remedied in a data cleaning process. <clears throat> so the second principle regarding data structure is that variable names should be the first and only the first row of your data. They should also adhere to best practices. A variable name should be unique, not duplicated. They should be meaningful. 
if you have a variable that represents gender, instead of calling it X1, call it gender. Um, do not, don't include spaces in your variable name. Don't include special characters except for underscores. So no backslashes, no dashes, no exclamation points, no quotation marks. I and mean, then also don't start a variable name with a number or a special character. And these aren't arbitrary practices, they all serve a purpose. So first, they make your variable names more interpretable and easier to work with. And then second, they make your variables more compatible with languages like R. So for instance, R does not allow variable names to start with a number. It will actually give you an error if you do this. Um, another example is that R doesn't allow you to use uh, dashes or hyphens in your variable names. They are considered subtraction or negation operators. So again, you will get an error if you include those characters in your variable names. So let's do our first exercise here. Um, take one minute to review this messy data and look for any structure issues going on here. And remember, by structure, I mean review how both rows and columns are laid out, as well as variable names. And if you find any errors, please type them in the chat. I will try to monitor the chat over here. So I'm going to start this timer and just kind of drop whatever you see in the chat and we'll we'll gather back in a minute. Good ones. <laughs> yep. Um, or is your oh is did your screen freeze again? Oh my no 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 we haven't done anything. Oh did you click the timer to start it though? Yeah. Did you not you don't see it? I don't see it going. Sorry everyone. Yeah, that was my fault. It's showing on the other screen over here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it just ran out of time. So Right. But it looks like everybody got similar things to what I was thinking about. So let's go and review that together. Okay. So um, I think a lot of people saw the same things that I saw. So one was that variable names are not the first row of the data. They're the seventh line down, actually. Um, the other thing is that our data does not make a rectang rectangle. We have empty columns. We have empty rows. And then our variable names don't adhere to best practices, right? So we have backslashes in some of our variable names. We have spaces in some of our variable names. But I think, oh, can someone try to say something? I think we all saw pretty similar things. So those are all things we would need to deal with um, when we're kind of cleaning up our data. Okay, so the second thing is variable values. So variable values should be explicit, not implicit. We don't ever want anyone to have to guess what a cell value means. So if a blank cell is implied to be zero, fill that cell with an actual zero. No color coding should be used to indicate information. Uh, make a new variable. So if you're color coding a variable in order to indicate treatment, for instance, instead make a treatment variable and add the values to that variable. <clears throat> values should be analyzable. This means no more than one measure should be captured in a variable. So for instance, we don't want both weight and height in the same variable. It would be very difficult to analyze a variable with combined information like that. We want to split this information into two columns. Variables should be captured consistently within a column. Pick a format and stick to it. Um, so, for instance, dates should be captured consistently. You can make a decision to always capture dates in the international standardized format shown here, which is a really nice format to work with. Uh, but honestly, whatever format you choose, make sure that all dates are captured using the same format. Uh, you can click on this date in the slides here to learn more about this specific format if you want to learn more about it. Categories should be captured consistently, both spelling and capitalization. So if you're capturing something like gender, you always want to spell male the same way, female the same way, and so forth. This allows your data to be easily categorized. And last, if the variable is numeric, the value should fall within your expected range. So if the range for a variable is 1 to 50, you shouldn't see values outside of that range. 
So let's do another quick exercise. I will do the timer correctly this time. What variable value issues do you notice in our sample data? Please drop in the chat whatever you see. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 These are great. Yeah, you all are catching it. I like Peter's question. Yep, you all are right on. Okay, so let's look at it together. <clears throat> and I think you, everyone found all the issues that I found. So color coding is used to indicate information here. Um, and actually the color coding perfectly aligns with the treatment variables already. So we can actually just ignore this color coding, which is nice, um, but otherwise we'd have to deal with this. Um, that's in the treatment variable. Then we have two things measured in one column for both start BP and the pre-post weight. Um, so we would want to split those out into multiple columns. And then last, categorical values are being captured inconsistently in both our ethnic and our race variable. So we would need to recategorize those. Okay, variable types. Variables should be stored as your expected type, or in the R world, we may refer to this as variable class. Well, let's review a few of the variable classes that you might work with. <clears throat> so the first is numeric, and this contains numeric values. It could like like any of these numeric values here. Numeric variables cannot contain special characters, spaces, or letters. And if your variable contains non-numeric values, the class will be character. And you'll no longer be able to perform calculations on your numeric variables, so no means ranges, and so forth. Uh, the next one is date, time, or date time. It's represented in R as one of these formats you see here. And because of the way dates are stored in R, they allow you to perform calculations using your dates, which is cool. You can add dates, you can subtract dates, and so forth. So as long as your dates are stored as dates, then you are good. However, if your dates are stored as character values, you're not going to be able to perform those calculations on your dates. So it's important to check your date types when you read your data in. So sometimes they are read in as dates, um, other times they could be read in as character values or numeric values, and it's important to be aware of this. Another one is character. They contain character values or strings. It could be any of these kind of examples. You can even store numbers as characters, but remember, if you want to analyze those values as numeric, you will need to change them to a numeric format. And then the last one we're going to talk about today is a factor. This is a special class of variables, helpful when working with categorical or ordinal variables. Uh, factors assign an order to your variable groups, so they're really useful for ordering groups in tables or graphs or models. But you must assign this class to your variable. So when you read in your data, your character variables will not automatically be assigned as factors. You'll need to assign this class to yourself. Um, and then last, because factors can be a little tricky to work with and understand, you can learn more about working with factors in this article I linked here from Amelia McNamara and Nicholas Horton. Okay, so one quick exercise. Um, what is the R class for the following variables? So this variable right here. If somebody just wants to drop it in the chat and tell me what this variable is. I'm not stumping anybody today. <laughs> yeah, it's character. And I don't know if you can see why, but it's because there's a space right before the 7.5 here. And I've, I've worked with data where this has happened and it stumped me for quite a while. I couldn't figure out why it was a character and it's one little space before 7.5. So watch out for that. <laughs> uh, the next one, what about this variable? I think most people are getting it. Yeah. So this one's actually, um, if we did class in an R, it's a, it's a factor um, because it's got these levels associated with it. And so this is what makes it a factor. And then our last one here, 
Anybody want to tell me what this one is? Yeah, yeah, character, right? Because these letters are messing up my number values, and so it's it's currently a character variable. Yeah, great. One more exercise. What variable type issues do you notice in our sample data? Again, we'll do one more minute. Have you dropped something in the chat? <clears throat> Yeah, you guys are seeing things that I would see. <clears throat> yep. Awesome. I think everyone caught the same issues that I was seeing. Well, let's go ahead and review this together. <clears throat> so a lot of people saw that one of our date variables, the start date, is being stored as a number instead of a date. And then we have a lot of text being stored in our numeric variables. And so that's going to make all of these character variables instead of numeric. So we're going to need to deal with all of these issues here. Even this one variable that has one character value is going to make the whole column character now. So we will need to deal with those. And the last thing to talk about is missing data. So missing data should appear as you expect it to. That's both the amount of missingness as well as the variable in cases that data is missing for. And there are varying opinions on how missing data should be assigned. So uh, some people think that missing data should be explicitly assigned with an extreme value like negative 999 or negative 99. Um, that way you know that the cell wasn't just skipped over by accident when data is being entered. Some people prefer to just leave the cell blank to not cause confusion by adding these extreme values to your variable. Um, I imagine within this audience, we have varying opinions on missing data. Um, and all I want to say is I have no preference for which method is used. I think it is important to be aware of the problems that can be caused by adding extreme values to your data. So if you do add negative 99 as a missing value, you know, be aware that someone could accidentally interpret that as an actual value leading to bad results. But ultimately, what I think is important is that you use consistent values to represent missing data. So choose one and stick with it. Um, and then make sure your choices are documented so that future users know how to interpret the values in your data. And then last, you want to make sure that your missing values match your variable type. If you use text to define missing values in a numeric variable, that variable will no longer be considered a numeric variable. So be aware of those kind of issues. So what missing data issues do you notice in our sample data? And we'll do one more minute. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It looks like everyone found the same issues that, that I found as well. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the first thing I noticed that is that I had some unexpected missing data. So uh, row 23, um, you know, maybe that's a row that I wasn't expecting to be missing data for that entire case. Um, so I would need to look into that. Uh, and then I have inconsistent missing values used. So sometimes I'm using not done and sometimes negative 99 is being used for numeric variables. And so it's inconsistent. Um, 
And then missing values don't match the variable type for the end emo and end DL. So we have character values being used for missing data in a numeric variable. Okay, so the number one way to reduce data errors is to make a plan before you collect data. So if you have the luxury of being able to collect your own data, you want to make sure that you spend time planning so you can correct data at the source. You want to plan the variables you want to collect. You want to build your data collection or entry tools in a way that follows your plan. You want to test your data tools before you collect or enter data. And you want to check your data often during data collection or entry. <clears throat> so let's walk through each of those. So plan the variables you want to collect. You want to plan ahead of time how you're going to name your variables. You want to plan for what the labels for those variables will be or the item wording. You want to plan for what the allowable variable type will be, numeric, character, so on. You want to plan for allowable values or ranges of each variable. And you want to plan for how you're going to assign missing values. So the items on the right here can be really helpful to plan for as well if you're collecting something like survey data in particular. So these items will help you better understand when, you, when and why you might have missing data for items. So um, the first thing is skip patterns. Are there skip patterns for any items? And what is the logic for those items? The second one is required items. Are items required or are people allowed to skip them? Helps you kind of decide whether the missing data is planned or not. Um, and then variable universe. What is the variable universe for each item? Will the whole sample get each item or are only some items shown to maybe a subsample of your group? And then you want to add those variables to a data dictionary. So a data dictionary is a rectangular formatted collection of names, definitions, and attributes about variables in a data set. So you set this up similar to a data set with a row and column layout with variable names in your first row. So in this data dictionary here, I have my variable names, the labels associated with those items, the types that are, that are allowed for each item, the allowable values, and the missing values I plan to use. And then you want to build your tools based on your data dictionary. And by tool, I mean whatever program you use to collect or enter data. So that could be Excel, RedCap, Qualtrics, or something else. Um, be aware that not all data entry and collected collection tools are created equal. So make sure to consider the limitations and the strengths of your tools. Um, you want to consider things like how your tool handles data security and privacy, versioning, data validation. We're not going to explore different data collection entry tools today, but if you want to learn more about the strengths and weaknesses of various tools, uh, specifically if you want to learn more about the limitations of using Excel as a data collection tool, you can watch this video that's linked down here at the bottom um, from a previous R in Medicine workshop. Uh, so once you've to chosen your tool, you want to build your data collection tool based on your data dictionary. So you want to name your variables correctly in your tool. So instead of Q1, Q2, Q3, you want to name those variables ID, start, date, treatment. Uh, this reduces confusion during data entry, and it also creates less data cleaning steps when you export your data. You want to build items to only allow acceptable, to accept allowable values. <laughs> um, so if you're working with numeric items, only allow values in a specified range. So for example, zero to 50. You can set these validation rules in your tool so that if someone tries to enter 51, it'll say, hey, this value is not allowed. If you're working with categorical items, only allow values in specified categories. So here it can be really helpful to use something like a drop down menu instead of open text boxes to make sure that you're only collecting allowable values. And then you want to build items to only accept specified variable types. <clears throat> so only numeric or only dates in the specified format. Again, you can set these content validation rules in your tool so that a warning will pop up when unexpected formats or types are entered. And then you want to test your data collection or entry tool. So collect or enter some sample data. Check, um, check the sample data. Are any items missing? Are you getting unexpected values for items? Are any values out of range? Do they have incorrect formats, inconsistent entries? Is the skip logic working as expected? Are people able to skip items that they shouldn't be able to skip? And if you find anything wrong, fix this in your tool before you begin to collect or enter data. And then last, you want to review your data often during data collection or entry. 
And one option for reviewing your data is to write code in a program like R to validate your specified criteria. So you can write code to validate that variables are your expected types, fall within expected ranges, that IDs are not duplicated, and so forth. So here are a couple of R packages that have functioned specifically for validation purposes, and they export really helpful reports for you to review. Um, there will actually be a presentation during this conference uh, on the last package on this list, uh, this one right here, um, I believe on Thursday at 3 Eastern. Um, and then at the very bottom, this is a link to a great talk on validation that reviews all these packages and more, and I highly recommend watching it. Um, but here I'm showing a very brief example of how I might set up some validation criteria using the point blank package. And I could run this on a recurring schedule during data collection or entry to make sure everything is being collected as expected. So I'm checking, um, the things that I'm checking in this function are, um, do I have uh, distinct IDs? Do I have missing IDs? Are my uh, columns the expected types? Are they falling within my expected ranges down here? And when I run this code, I receive this report that assures me that everything is being collected as expected, except for there are two variables that are failing. So my start date variable is not being collected in a date format, and my ethnicity variable has collected some unexpected values. And this is something that if I caught it early enough, I could go and fix in my tool. Because if I don't fix this, I could end up with really messy data. Or I might even end up with data that's completely unusable if there's some values I collected that I can't interpret at all. And so you can see that they're failing um, in this report based on the, the failing numbers here. A second option for reviewing your data during collection is to create a codebook. So codebooks provide descriptive variable level information as well as univariate summary statistics like means and ranges and counts. Uh, there are several R packages that automate the creation of codebooks. I'm showing four here, but there are much more. But unlike validation, where we write code based on individualized criteria, for the most part, these uh, codebooks provide similar out-of-the-box summary statistics that allow you to get a feel for what's going on in your data. Both the validation and the codebook methods provide you great information to help you better understand if your data is being collected as expected. So here is one example of a codebook using the codebook R package. And if I ran this codebook, you can see, or ran this function, you can see that it gives me uh, a codebook that looks like this. And at the top, it provides me some overarching data set summary information, and then it quickly jumps into that variable level information, including summary statistics. And I can once again see here that I'm having issues with my start date variable. Um, it's being collected as numeric. <clears throat> and my ethnicity variable has some unexpected values. And I would want to go in and correct this at the source so I can fix this issue sooner rather than later. The other nice thing to know about codebooks is that they are even more useful when you're working with data that contains embedded metadata, like variable and value labels. Um, and you see in this data, you often see that when you get data from maybe SDSS or Stata. Um, but when you're working with label data, those labels are displayed in your codebook. So, for instance, if the data were labeled, you would see variable descriptions under each variable section that describes what each variable represents. So, for instance, under our PAT ID, you might see a label that says patient unique identifier. And that descriptive information would help me better interpret the data. But as you can see, these codebooks work fine without labels as well. Okay. So all these practices we just covered are obviously done in this ideal world where we have autonomy over how data is collected. But there are still going to be situations where you are handed data that you had no control over this data collection or entry process. Or maybe even if you did collect your own data, despite your best efforts to collect or enter clean data, you still end up with data that contains error. So for the remainder of this workshop, we will be working through a sample messy data set to both identify and resolve issues to leave us with a usable, tidy data set that's ready for analysis. So here's our scenario. We have data that originate from an observational study comparing three treatments of ulcerative colitis. And we have this analysis question here. Are there differences in change in MES and QL scores between start and finish? And are the decreases in scores greater for any of the three new medications? And in order to answer this question, we've asked the student to extract data from the medical record into Excel. Uh, along with our spreadsheet of data, we're provided a data dictionary, which is great. 
Um, and we start to review the data and we find a sundry of errors that need correction. So we have this scenario. And believe it or not, we are not going to jump right in to loading the data into R just yet. The first thing we really should do is open the Excel file and review both the data and the data dictionary. While it seems kind of low tech, it's actually really important to learn what you are getting into before you read the file into R. So both the data and the data dictionary are in the same file. Let's take five minutes to log into Posit Cloud and navigate to our project and then to our data file. We're going to open and review both the data dictionary and the data to see what's actually going on in our file. Um, and I also just wanted to say throughout this workshop, when you finish with an exercise, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Um, if you're having trouble with an exercise, give us a, a wave um, or drop something in the chat or even just unmute yourself and chat with us. Um, and go ahead and hopefully most of you have made accounts with Posit Cloud and gotten into our project. Um, but you can navigate to all that through our, our website here. So if you click on this, it should get us to do our account here. And I'm going to go ahead and start this timer. And then just let us know. <laughs> just let us know what questions you have. <laughs> I think this medical student was not given the guidance that we just covered. <laughs> So if you get, so mine looks different than yours, but if you get to our, sorry, Shannon, I'm looking for R. Oh, it's probably so long now. <laughs> you have to fast forward through. Get more content. <clears throat> Aha, here, this is what I wanted to show you. <laughs> so if you can get into our project, a copy of the project. Hmm. So if you're in our website, you can click on this link here. To get to um, Posit Cloud. I'm trying to make this where I can see it. And then once you get into our assignment, it should look something like this, where you can see the environment over here <clears throat> from the files. So we just kind of maybe want to do Control L to clear your console and uh, restart R to control, clear yeah, your environment. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's clear all people. this. <laughs> Let's just clear all this. Okay. Yeah. yeah so it should look something like this. <laughs> and then just click on that data folder. That's where you're going to find your Excel data. Yeah. If you click on this, this is where it's at. And so I think if you, you can say a uh, view mm -hmm. file, and then I think it should just download over here. So it won't be named the same. It'll say file show, but that's okay. Uh, someone said they keep hearing the mic. It, it could be me. I don't know. <laughs> I, I hear it too. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Yeah. Don't hesitate to let us know if you have questions. And I, I know it's a lot kind of getting into how the cloud and getting into the projects and all that stuff. So. Oh, so somebody, I think Nancy's done. <laughs> yeah, we're doing on time here. We can always give it a little more time if we need to.
Cool, we're getting some thumbs up. Okay, well, I saw some thumbs up. Um, so feel free to keep kind of, if you're still trying to get logged in and all that stuff, feel free to keep working on that and then we will, we will move forward. <clears throat> and then Shannon and Peter, just let me know if I need to stop for any reason. Okay, so hopefully for those of you that were able to get into the data file, um, you noticed a few things upon reviewing our data, which I think Peter alluded to in the chat. Um, so one, our variable names are not the first row of our data. There are six kind of rows of irrelevant information before we finally get to the variable names. And that's really important to know before we try to import our data. And the other thing to know is that our data is not the first sheet of our Excel file. It's actually the third sheet over and it's called data, the name of the sheet is. And that's also important to know. So that's why we wanted to get in there and start reviewing things. So we are now ready to import our data into R. The first thing we would want to do is open an R script or you know an R markdown file or a courtroom file. And we are going to use the read Excel function in this example from the read Excel package to import our data. So there are several arguments to consider when using this function. So the first one is path. This is where we list the path to our XLSS, XLSX file. Um, the next argument is the sheet argument. We can add the name or the position of the sheet to read in. The next argument is call names with a default of true. And this just says, should R grab the call names from the first row of your data, yes or no? True or false? Um, the next argument is the NA argument. And here it's saying, um, are there any values that R should read in as NA? So for instance, if we had those negative 99s as our missing value indicator, we could tell R to convert all of our negative 99s to NA when we read in the data if we wanted to. Um, and then the skip argument is asking, what's the minimum number of rows R should skip before reading anything in? There's actually a lot more arguments you can type uh, question mark, read underscore Excel into your console to see more arguments for this function. So as I mentioned before, the very first thing we would do in the real world is open our script or our markdown or Quarto file so that we can save our code as we write it. Um, so your RStudio pane would look something like this. Um, and then we would use the read Excel function to read in our data. Um, notice that I'm giving you a hint here that in this situation, we would want to use both the sheet and the skip arguments. I'm not showing you the full code here because we are going to do this in an exercise in just a moment. Uh, but do pay attention to the fact that I'm putting quotation marks around the sheet um, and that they aren't really they aren't needed for the skip argument. And then once we read in our data, you should get something that looks like this. Um, this is just a small portion of the data, but you'll you'll get something that looks like this. So it's your turn. Hopefully you're now in Posit Cloud in our project. Um, so take three minutes to actually import the data. So you'll want to find and open that preloaded Porto file called exercises.qmd, navigate to the CL1 exercise, update the code in that chunk, and then you can run the code chunk using the green arrow on the chunk for anybody who's new to, to our markdown in Porto. So let's do three minutes for that. 
And then I'll try to pull it up so you can see what I'm talking about as well. So it should look something like this. And you should be able to navigate to CL1 here. And this is the green button I'm talking about to uh, run the code chunk once you update this section. And then again, just give us a, a thumbs up when you're done or a hand wave if you need help. And I will try my best to see what's going on here. I'm seeing some thumbs up. That's promising. <laughs> Please don't hesitate to ask if you need help or if you're stuck. And if you do go to our, our the website, um, there is the solution to the exercise in there too, if you are stuck. <clears throat> you're right, Peter. Yeah, so there, there is the two different ways to do the sheet argument. Absolutely. On the website, they have a, a cold code fold option on them. So uh, if you want to see the code, you'll actually have to click on the little triangle beside the solutions to see the code that was used. Uh, and that's to challenge you. <laughs> We've got a little less than a minute left. We'll let people wrap up. <clears throat> okay, awesome. So to keep Keep moving forward. Um, we will move on, but feel free to keep communicating with Shannon and Peter in the chat. Can you just show them the solution real quick? Yeah, of course. <laughs> just that one, just so we can move forward in the workshop. Yeah, good call. Good yeah. call. Here we go. Okay. And one so, quick thing. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm clicking on uh, exercise QMD, but it's not opening for me. I'm not sure why it would not open. <laughs> Are you clicking on it in Posit Cloud? Yes. Oh, of course, I'm already disconnected. <laughs> so so you're in this kind of area and you're clicking yes. this once yes. and it doesn't open. That is no, I, that that stumped me. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, but you could yeah, all the all the exercises are in the website as well. So if you don't, if you can't get it to work in Posit Cloud, you can still kind of review this. So here's the code chunk. So if you review the code fold here, this is the solution. So um, you can put in the name of the sheet, and as Peter put in the chat, you could also use the sheet number. So it was one, two, three over. You could put in sheet equals three instead of the name of the sheet in quotation marks. Either would work. And then we wanted to skip the first six rows. Um, to get to the variable names, um, and the, and remember that the the column names is defaulted to true um, to pull the to pull the column names from the files. So um, we didn't even need to write that argument in here. So, okay.
Okay, so now that we've imported our data, it's time to start reviewing that data. And to quote the authors of R for Data Science, um, EDA or data exploration is not a formal process with a strict set of rules. More than anything, it's a state of mind. Uh, during the initial phases of data exploration, you should feel free to investigate every idea that occurs to you. So what does this mean? It just means that there's no one way to review your data. There are endless ways to figure out if there are errors in your data. Try any ideas you can think of. Um, with that said, there are still some common steps you can at least start with. So I would say after you read your data in the R, you're going to once again use that old fashioned method of opening up your data and looking at it to see if everything imported as you expected. After that, you can start to run some functions to review your data for the following thing. So you want to see how many rows do I have? How many columns? What are the variable types? What are variable values? Are my values falling within expected ranges? Or do I see outliers? Is there a lack of variation? How much missing data do I have? And how are variables related? You could do things like uh, bivariate plots. You know, is one variable high and the other is low? You know, is that expected? There are several functions that you can use to explore your data. These are seven examples here. There's much more than this, um, but this should get you started. So here's an example of exploring our data using this df summary function. Um, so this function, if you run it, provides you some overall summary information, including the number of rows and columns, as well as variable level summary information like variable type, the values, frequencies, and histograms. Here's another example using to explore data using the skim function. Uh, this function provides similar information to DS summary, just formatted a little different. So let's look at it. So it also provides that overall data summary information at the top, number of rows and columns, as well as variable level summary information, such as variable type, completion rate, values, percentiles, and histograms. Um, a quick clarification about this function, you'll notice that it provides a min and max value for some character variables. So that's uh, right here. And you might be like, what the heck is that? Um, this is actually the min and max character count for each variable. So while this may be a little confusing at first, this can actually be really helpful information. Okay, so our next exercise is to use one or more of these exploratory packages to review your data and then start to kind of jot down what fixes do you see that need to happen. Um, so let's go ahead and take five minutes to do that before we move on. So that'll be the CL2 exercise. So, oh, it keeps disconnecting. <clears throat> so if you just scroll down a little bit, you get to this blank chunk and just type in, you know, one or more of those functions and try them out. So I'll leave this up here so you can see the different functions. If you have questions, please let us know. Yeah, I see somebody has a question. <laughs> Hi, uh, in the last in the last exercise, there was yeah. a new names that shows up in the output. What did that mean? Sorry. Oh, it said like new names underneath when you ran it. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that um, because there were spaces in some of those, or like um, characters that character values that aren't allowed, or special values that aren't allowed. R kind of renames things in the import process. So okay. since it doesn't allow spaces or it doesn't allow, you know, whatever the special characters are that doesn't allow like a dash, it'll replace those with its own kind of um, 
allowable okay. value, if that makes sense. So it's saying, I, I gave you new names, not please give me new names. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. like, hey, check your names because they're not they're not as expected because they're no longer what you thought you were reading in. They're a little different. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you and, so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And Shannon's mentioning that she's going to talk about renaming stuff too, because even oh. though our name for you, you still probably aren't going to like the names and you'll want to rename them again yourself. So right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Shannon, should we go ahead and take a break and then people can keep working or take a break? Somebody thinking? That seems reasonable. We're at 11. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so this is, this is the transition point anyway. So I'm, we can just, if, if people are done and want to go take a break, this might be a good time to do that. Bathroom, coffee, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and put up a break timer so that people know when we will, will resume. And so, yeah, feel free to use this time to either take your break or continue with this exercise. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. We can swap. <clears throat> All right, so our timer is up, and so feel free to use this time to continue with the exercise or take your break, and then we will resume normal content at 12.05.
All right, everyone. I hope you had a good, quick break, and uh, it is time to get started. So I am going to be talking for the next 50 minutes about stage one data cleaning, and then you will get another five minute break um, before Peter Higgins section for stage two, two data cleaning. Um, just to kind of illustrate uh, what Crystal Lewis did in the last exercise, uh, the objective was to use an exploratory function. You can just grab all of these code solutions right here, use this little icon to copy to clipboard, and then you should be able to copy and paste it directly into Posit Cloud. You'll notice that Posit Cloud does time out after a little bit of uh, unuse, but you can certainly get it back up and running quickly. So I'm just going to paste all of those code solutions into my R chunks. There was a question in the chat about uh, do we put our R code into these um, brackets? So yes, this signifies the beginning of an R chunk. This signifies the end of an R chunk. And then we could just click this green arrow to run all of the code. Um, and it is going to produce all of the results for all of those different uh, exploratory analyses, um, which unfortunately we don't have the time to review in detail, but they are there for you to review. And the Posit Cloud instance will stay open if you want to use this as a little playground. All right. I'm going to look at the full screen slides. I'm going to navigate to my section of stage one data cleaning. And there's a great uh, example in, or question in the chat about someone noticed that there was messaging when we imported, oh, just skipped a section. Uh, someone noticed that there was messaging when we initially imported the data set. Um, and that was a great um, catch. And so when we saw our original variable names in Excel, um, this is what they looked like. And then when we imported them, we saw uh, some slightly different variable names. Uh, so some of the differences that we see here are instead of a blank column, this is imported as dot, dot, dot seven, because this is the seventh column in the data set. Um, and I think that's the only difference uh, that Read Excel did for you. Um, and some of the reasons it does that is just to ensure uniqueness of variable names. For example, if you had another like column, but you can see here that our variable names still aren't entirely consistent and also kind of difficult to work with in programming. So variable names with white space in them are challenging to work with or with special characters like a slash can be challenging to work with. So our variable names are still not ideal. And this is how they were imported with Read Excel. But one of the very first things that many of us do when we get started with a new data set is we use the function from the janitor package called clean names. And what clean names is going to do is it's going to remove special characters and implement snake case um, uh, encoding by default. So again, we're just taking our raw data frame and piping it into the janitor clean names functions. And you'll see that we have a few differences. So instead of a variable name with periods, um, that is translated to an X. Instead of white space, we have underscores. And also, everything is converted uh, to lowercase and separated by underscores instead of having special characters like slashes. So it's only underscores are the only characters in addition to um, alpha numbers and uh, letters that are allowed. Uh, with janitor clean names. So it gives you a better base for starting your programming. Another thing that we saw in our data frame already is that we have empty rows and columns. And so for the next few slides for stage one data cleaning, I'm always going to set this up in terms of the problem we have how we can address it with a solution. And then we're going to confirm that our solution worked. So problem, solution, confirm. Problem, solution, confirm. Uh, so just to kind of show you the problem, what I'm doing is using some tidyverse functions to only show you a few columns in the data set. So I'm selecting the patient ID column, as well as everything between race and start VP. And I'm slicing the rows. So I'm only showing you rows 13 through 18. And so what you can see here is we have our blank column here and our blank row here, which is not ideal. 
But honestly, like I received a data set in work this week that has data just like this, like it is normal. Uh, so a solution to this is to use another janitor function called remove empty. In remove empty, you can specify uh, what needs to be removed. In this case, we're going to remove both empty rows and empty columns. So you can see when I do the same selecting and the same slicing, we no longer have that blank column and we no longer have that blank row. Another way you can kind of confirm this is with the glimpse function. So the glimpse function allows you to get a quick overview of your data set. Um, so uh, for our original data set, you can see we had 31 rows and 38 columns. And now that we've removed our empty rows and empty columns, we're now down to 30 rows and 37 columns. Another problem we have already identified in this data set is the need to do some recoding. So when we count the different values of our ethnic variable, you can see we have inconsistent coding. So Hispanic is coded three different ways and not Hispanic is coded two different ways. A solution to address this problem is to use the mutate statement in the Tidyverse in the dplyr package, which allows you to create a new variable. So in this case, I'm creating a new variable called ethnic clean and creating a cleaned version of the ethnic variable by using a case when statement. What we're doing is laying out specific conditions on each row for recoding variables. So we're going to read this is when the original variable ethnic takes on one of these three values. So percent in percent is an operator that says it has to be in one of these three values exactly. So if it's lowercase Hispanic, uppercase Hispanic, or this misspelled version of Hispanic, we're going to recode that to be Hispanic. If ethnic variable is in either the two ways we can specify not Hispanic, we're going to recode that as not Hispanic. And then another option we're going to use in our case when variable is the default value. So if condition one is not satisfied, and if condition two is not satisfied, then whatever rows are left over should take on a default value of the original ethnic variable. So when we count our ethnic clean variable, uh, we should only see two values, Hispanic and not Hispanic. We should not see the four values. Um, and I believe it's very important to maintain both your original variable and your new cleaned variable as separate things, like not to overwrite your original variable. Because if you overwrite your original variable, you have no way of confirming if your coding works correctly. So the way you're going to confirm that your coding works correctly is to count the two variables side by side. So I'm counting my original ethnic clean variable versus my, sorry, my new ethnic clean variable versus my original ethnic variable. In which case I can see there's three ways you can be coded as Hispanic and two ways you can be coded as not Hispanic to confirm that my recoding worked correctly. Okay, so now we're going to go to exercise SP1 in data cleaning fundamentals. Uh, sorry, that should just say stage one data cleaning. Uh, so I'm going to go over to Posit Cloud. Um, I just want to highlight here uh, that you will need to run some things to get started, right? So you, you want to make sure that your DF raw has been imported. You want to specify data and your sheet and skip equals six. You're going to run this to make sure you have DF raw in your global environment. I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear this out so that it looks a little cleaner. You also need to create your DF clean. That's kind of our, our base to get started with. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this chunk that's going to remove the empty rows and columns. So now we have our DF raw and our DF clean. And now your objective for exercise one are to explore the values of race, kind of identify the problems to clean the values of race by creating a new variable called race clean and to confirm that race clean is coded correctly. So I'm going to hop back over to the slides and start the timer.
Right, that is time. And we had some great questions about what does the dot default argument actually do? So just to make this super quick and easy, I'm going to pop over here and grab the code solutions and copy and paste them into Posit Cloud. So first of all, I'm going to count the values of race to kind of find that problem and explore what's going on. Um, so you can see we have some mixed coding of certain values um, and we want to combine African-American and Afro-American um, and some other values as well. So to illustrate uh, more concretely uh, what that dot default does, I'll show it to you with and without the dot default option. So I'm just going to copy and paste a couple of things over here in the interest of time, and I'll get out my confirm code and put it in here. So what I'm going to do just to show you what's happening is I'm going to comment out the dot default so it doesn't actually execute. So let's run this. So our solution here is to use a case when statement. Uh, we're going to create race clean. We're going to assign these two values to African-American and these three values to other, but without a default. Um, it might require something after the comma. It doesn't. Okay. And now we're going to see what happened without a default. And so um, all we did in race clean is we evaluated two specific conditions. We and evaluated a condition on African-American and Afro-American that got recoded to African-American. And then these three values got recoded to other. But you see, because we only evaluated those two conditions, the remaining values were not recoded in our race clean variable. And basically, we just want to transfer these over these values over to our race variable. So like the race values itself should be the default for race clean when these conditions are not satisfied. So when we put dot default equals race, back in our uh, case win statement, run this, and then rerun our cleaning. Now we can see um, that all of the values are assigned um, in race clean, and they are assigned correctly. So there's two ways you can be coded as African-American. There's three ways you can be coded as other, and then everything else is left as is. All right. I hope that clarifies things for people that had questions about the dot default. Um, and in case you're watching along, there was some great discussion in the chat about um, people didn't know about the dot default argument, um, and it's newer uh, in the release of Dpire. All right. So another issue that we are going to be facing in our data is we need to replace some values with missing. So for example, we already identified in uh, Crystal's portion um, that there were some negative 99s in our data, which actually should be coded as uh, NA. So we can see these again by just counting the values of that variable. So in this case, um, this variable itself is named end NA, which actually has nothing to do with missing values. I believe it's the ending value of sodium um, for this particular subject. So, um, but here we have a negative 99 value. And you can also see if you do some visual exploration that this is really inconsistent with the other values in the data set. And that should be a flag for you as well um, that something weird might be happening. Uh, so hopefully you can go back to your source documentation and find that, oh yeah, negative 99s were represented missing values. So a solution here is to use the NA if function. So what it's going to do is it's going to take any values in the end in a variable, um, if they are taken on a value of negative 99, it's going to convert it to a proper R and A. Um, notice again, I'm using that, not, okay, not sodium. Thank you for um, uh, clarifying Peter in the chat there. Uh, so um, and notice again, I'm still using that strategy of creating a clean variable and leaving that original variable as is. And that's so we can explicitly confirm our uh, that our code worked. So it's a really important strategy. So we're going to, again, use the counting uh, technique to confirm that things worked. So you can say when we count these values side by side, negative 99 is explicitly coded to an A. Um, and this would be even clearer if you had more than one value of negative 99. I mean, like you would see a count of two there or three there. That's why counting works so well. 
Um, and then if we look at our histogram and our ranges of values, you can see that um, there's nothing greatly out of range and our, our visual of this variable looks much better. So we're gonna use NAF to replace values with missing. Another thing that you'll see here is an incorrect variable type. So um, Crystal talked about how variable types or classes of variables are super important when you're working uh, in R to make sure you can do what you need to do with the data. So here we have end emo, which correct me if I'm wrong again, Peter, represents the end emotional score, I believe, uh, for these subjects. Uh, and you can see here, for some reason, it looks like a number, but we have these quotes around it. So it's clearly read in as a character. Um, our glimpse function is telling us that that end emo variable is indeed a character. And there's consequences to this. Um, so a consequence to this is that we actually can't take the mean of that variable because it's a character. Like, even though it looks like numbers, you can't take a mean of something that's stored as a character. And um, if you kind of look at all of the values of this uh, end emo score, let's see if we can kind of hunt through and figure out why these are stored as characters. So this is all of them just printed out. And you can see here, one of them was coded as not done, uh, which is why it actually imported as a character, even though these values look numeric. Um, one person, I believe, I'm gonna uh, mute one person, okay. And so that's the problem. That's what happened in our data. So let's look at our solution. Again, I'm going to create a clean version of this variable. Um, so I'm going to say end emo should be in A if it takes on a value of not done. And then I'm going to pipe that result into another function. So all this is going to do is replace um, that not done value with NA, but it, we're still going to have that problem that that value variable is character. It doesn't can do the character to numeric version. So then I'm going to pipe it into the as numeric function. And that's actually going to coerce that variable to now be a numeric variable. So when we look at our uh, confirmation, uh, when we look at end emo versus end emo clean, uh, originally, it was character. Now it says it's double, which is a type of numeric uh, storage. Uh, we are actually able to take the mean of our end emo clean variable because it's now stored as uh, numeric. And we can also, again, count all of the values uh, to confirm to ourselves that the coding was done correctly. And, and even though you can't see it here, um, if you were to scroll through all of the values, uh, you would see um, that not done was coded correctly to an A. We also need to correct dates. Um, so dates out in the wild can be wild when you get them into R. Weird things can happen, especially when you're going from Excel to R. Um, so we've already looked at our start date variable, and we noticed it does not look like a date at all. Um, it is read into um, R as something called double, which is a numeric representation. Um, and when we look at all the values, we can see here, we still have these large integer values to represent our dates. Um, oops, okay. And then, so let's look at our solution. So there is a very handy function um, in Janitor package to handle these date conversions, specifically for uh, going from Excel numeric representations to actual proper date variables. So we're going to create a new variable called start date clean, and then convert it to a date uh, using the janitor convert to date function. And so when we confirm that, if we look at our start date and start date clean, you can see that this 44,208 is converted to 2021, uh, January 12th. Uh, and when we count our um, uh, two variables side by side, you can see how the conversions lined up. Um, if you're being like super specific, I would like look into numeric representations of dates in Excel and actually like do one by hand to confirm to myself that I believe the conversion is actually like happening correctly.
Another thing that we might want to do is extract numbers from text. So again, we're back to our uh, start and A variable. And here, when we're doing a glimpse of this column, uh, we can see it's stored as a character um, because it has character text in it. And again, the consequence of this is you cannot take the mean of a character value. Uh, and if we kind of scroll through all of the values, you can see there's nothing like uh, no missing data problems, like there's a proper NA in there, um, but it, all of these text strings are throwing us off. So the solution is, again, is to create a new clean version of that variable, and you can use the parse number function. So what that parse number function is going to do is it's only going to extract the numeric values from that field. So then when we go to confirm it, uh, we can see that our start in a clean variable represents, uh, has a value of double here, a numeric assignment. And you can see it only has numeric values. You are indeed able to take the mean of that now. And you can confirm that the coding works correctly again by your friendly count function. Um, so 133 um, is coded as 133. All right, so now it is your turn again to complete an exercise. The exercise in this case is to um, explore the type and values of start PLT to clean, to create a new variable called start PLT clean that corrects any usual values and assigns the correct coded variable type. And then of course, to confirm that coding. So you can drop down here in your SP2 to attempt that exercise.
All right. So that is time. We see a lot of excitement over the parse number um, function. So let's go over here to our start uh, PLT. So let's explore the values. Uh, there's, of course, different ways you can explore the values. You might want to count the different values. And we can see here uh, that it takes on um, some mixed string values. And also, it does, unfortunately, in, in addition to these mixed string values, it does, unfortunately, have this one assignment of clumped, which should be represented by an NA as well. Um, so we kind of have two different problems going on here. Um, another thing that you might want to see as well is that um, the glimpse function can, of course, always be handy. So we'll just kind of take a look at that. I'm not sure what I did wrong there. If anyone can see my error, please let me know. Huh. Right. Well, I am going to move on in the interest of time. Is it using oh, is it using the wrong slot? That's Somebody cool. had an issue with that earlier, Shannon. So maybe just go ahead and yeah, namespace it. Who was using the wrong slot? Also, yeah, fortunate. <laughs> um, okay, it might have been had to do with the way we loaded the packages. Thank you for that. Um, so again, there's a namespace conflict. Um, and that's why it couldn't find, it wasn't working appropriately. All right, so we can see that it's a character value there. Um, and then also, of course, if we want to just kind of take a look at all of the values, uh, we can um, pull it out um, using bracket notation. And so here we can see all of the values that we have to work with. Um, so our solution, someone else flagged that it might not be the right solution. Um, I'm not sure what that comment was, but let's go ahead and hear and see. So we're going to um, create a new variable. And instead of, um, I just started off oops, with a, a parse number uh, function just to see what would happen. All right, All right, pause it. I don't know what's happening. It does it again. Okay. Uh, hopefully it stays. All right. So um, I'm just going to use the parse number and see what happens. I mean, I know we have that character string of clumped and it might like make the correct assumption that clumped should be an A. Like there's no number to parse there. So let's just see what happens. So we've created our new DF clean with start PLT clean. And it says we had a warning, right? So there was one parsing failure. Uh, where we expected a number, but we saw uh, some just some text strings all clumped. So it's not an error, like it's not stopping the R code, but it is a warning. It's a nice little um, message. Oh, it says need to add in A equals clump. So let's just kind of open up the help file for parse number and see if that helps. Parse number. There are other questions about um, what. Um, package is parse number in. So parse number is in the read R function. And oh, it's not that handy look. Uh, so it says uh, we can specify in A values and that also could solve the problem. So we can say in A equals clumped here. And we run this. And now that warning disappears and we've explicitly specified R in A option. So thank you for that suggestion, Hannah. Uh, and so now we are just going to confirm that the start number uh, coded correctly. So again, we are going to just grab this code solution and paste it in. So we're going to count the old and the new values. You know, it's only going to show you the, the original 10. So um, you can either paginate through the rows here just to confirm that that clumped worked correctly. And one thing that I often do, like you don't, oh, it's the, uh, Base R is the default in this workspace. Um, as I often view the result, now you don't want this to render in your quarter document if you're looking at the entire quarter document, but that's just so you can skim through all of the values. And so we can see here when the original value was coded as clumped, it does take on a value of an A, and all of our other values look like they were 
assigned correctly. And again, another really important thing is that we started with a character string and we're ending up with a numeric string. And we want to confirm that that string is actually indeed numeric. So uh, we can just do like df clean, select, uh, we'll do these two variables and we'll do deep fire select just in case we have a conflict namespace. And then we will do a glimpse. And so here um, you can see that our clean value is indeed coded numerically and set as a character. All right. Um, someone asked about the code. So I will drop this one with an NA option into the chat. All right. We have about 12 more minutes in this session before we take another break. All right. So another problem that we might face is a character variable should be a factor. And that really just depends on how you're using that variable and what you're doing with it. So in this case, we have a treatment variable that takes on three values of Oza, Upa, and Usti. And Peter can tell you about those all day long. I'm not familiar with these three treatments. Um, but the consequence of this character variable being left as a character variable is that in any kind of presentation type things you do, it is going to be presented in terms of alphabetical ordering. So even in our simple count here, um, it's listed in alphabetical order. Um, and it's the same with like our ethnic clean variable. Again, it's character, so it's listed in alphabetical order. Um, you can see that these two variables, treatment and ethnic clean, are both stored as character values. And when you go to kind of present things more formally, like in a GT summary table or in a ggplot figure, those tables or those figures will be arranged alphabetically. So I love GT summary for creating summary tables. So here, this is just a simple table summary. And again, our treatments are listed in alphabetical order and our ethnicity values are also listed in alphabetical order. And you might want to have those treatments or ethnicity values rearranged. So for example, maybe one of these treatments is a standard of care and it should come first in your table. Or maybe you want to present the most common value of ethnicity first instead of an alphabetical order. And the way you can approach and solve this problem is by converting these variables from characters to factors. So here we have two different uh, functions that I'm using. I'm going back to my ethnic clean variable, and I'm piping in the result of this case when statement into this function called fct underscore in freak. What it's going to do is it's going to convert that character string or character variable into a factor in order of the frequency of the values observed. So the most frequent value will be the first level of that factor variable. And those levels will be in accordance of the frequency observed. A separate function that I'm using to recode the treatment variable is I'm using the fct underscore relevel function. So in this case, if you recall, um, we all we had they had the same frequency, right? 10, 10, and 10. And our objective here isn't necessarily to code it in terms of some sort of frequency, but maybe there's a standard of care that needs to go first, or there's a logical ordering to these different treatments. So here I'm explicitly stating the level ordering of this uh, treatment variable. So I want UPA to be the first level, then USTI, then OZA. Now these two um, functions, FCT and FREAK and FCT relevel, are from the forecasts package. And there's a whole ho like host of um, factor functions you can use to handle factors in the forecasts package. So I'm just showing you two here. So now we want to confirm uh, what happened. So um, here is our original, our, our new treatment variable. So we have recoded it as a factor. You can see that assignment right here where it says SCT. So it is a factor variable. And now it is in the order that we specified UPA, USTI, OZA. So we have UPA, USTI, and OZA. 
Again, for uh, ethnicity, now we are, again, we have a factor variable and it's presenting an order of most frequent to least frequent uh, because we use FCT underscore and freak. So we have not Hispanic followed by Hispanic. If we take a just a brief look at those two variables, just to confirm, uh, again, we can see that these are now coded as factor variables instead of character. And then when we go to make our formal uh, summary table using GT summary, they're going to present an order that we specified. So we're going to have UPA, USTE, then OSA, and we're going to have our more frequent ethnicity followed by our less frequent ethnicity. So that takes us to uh, data cleaning exercise three. I'll give you a quick overview of that. Um, it is a, a prerequisite of this that you completed data cleaning exercise one or SP1. So I would recommend that you copy and paste the code from SP1 before you get started. And uh, when you do do SP1, so you want to look at the values of race clean and you want to convert the values of race clean, clean to a factor such that it presents in um, an order of the most common values and then confirm the new coding of race clean. So I am going to start the timer for you there.
Right. So let's illustrate this exercise super quickly. I'm going to go to uh, SP3. We're going to explore the values of race clean. Uh, and we're going to see uh, that it is a character and we want to change the ordering of that character variable by converting it to a factor. So let's uh, clean that. And then here, I'm just going to pipe in that Kate results of that case win statement to an FCT underscore in a freak uh, to put it in uh, frequency order. Uh, I've got that warning again, uh, which was from the parse number here that we corrected earlier. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, and then we're going to confirm it. So we're going to confirm the new coding of race and race clean. Uh, so it should still have kind of the same assignments, but now you'll notice that race clean is stored as a factor instead of a character. And uh, if we count the values of race clean, what you will see here is now it's in the order of the frequency of those race values. It is time for our last break, um, unfortunately. So there is a problem of separating values. Uh, so one way you can separate values that are contained in a single variable that's separated by slash uh, is using by separate wider delim. And then another feature that we're not going to have time to discuss in detail, if I can move to the next slide, uh, is assigning labels. And so you saw me kind of twist my tongue over here when I'm like, I don't know the exact context still of all of this clinical data. Um, and it's because that context is contained in that Excel sheet. Um, and so one thing that you can do is you can actually create labels for variables, and it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but you know that when we view our data here, all we see is our variable names. And instead, you can actually convert your data to have labels in it. So underneath your variable names, you'll see a brief description of those variables. So you don't you have that context as what the data means at your hands. But again, apologies, we don't have time to go over that today, but that is there for you if you want to learn more. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and put it up for our five minute break before Peter takes over for stage two cleaning. I believe Crystal is going to put on, take over the sharing and put on a timer. Uh, do I have a timer? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, then I can do it. I can put okay. on a timer. So let me take the sharing back, and um, I will. I will put on. So let's find the timer and see. Pop it out. Start it, and I'm going to share again. I can find it. And I will put it back over here for our schedules. So you know exactly where we're at. Um, and so we're taking our quick break right now. And then Peter's going to pick it up with stage two cleaning. Uh, while you're breaking, of course, we're happy to answer any questions in the chat.
Okay. So our break is done and welcome back. Hopefully everybody's had a moment to get a break. There were a couple of notes in the chat about the difficulty of wrangling medication data. Um, there is a package that was presented at our medicine a couple of years ago called the DOPE package. And there's some links in the chat about that that may be helpful, particularly with drug names and putting drugs into categories. So I'm Peter Higgins, and I'm going to be talking about wrangling your data or stage two data cleaning. Stage one was critical for doing the key things that you need to do on nearly every data set. Uh, data exploration and validation. Uh, data validation is a continuous process right up to the time that you and your investigators, co-investigators agree on data lock. We discussed the importance of preventing data errors at the source, being directly involved in data collection and data entry, preferably using a tool with data validation at entry like REDCap. And we did the stage one cleaning to clean each column and row, cleaning the variable names, removing empty columns and rows, fixing variable types and classes, addressing missingness, violations of tidy data principles to separate combined data pieces like the two pieces of blood pressure, and adding meaningful variable labels. Uh, all of that creates a clean rectangle of data, which generally is required in nearly every data cleaning. And while stage one is required in nearly all projects, the stage two data cleaning I'm going to be talking about is frequently needed, but not in all projects. So we'll cover in this section the frequent but optional topics of restructuring data as long or wide format, thickening or padding longitudinal data, and joining multiple data sets. So typically we think of data as structured in wide or long format. And here's an example of wide format where we have run one row. Oh, Peter, we don't see your slides. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, fortunately, a lot of it was text. That's okay. Um, which I read through and hopefully that all made sense. Um, so here are three topics in this section. And here's an example of wide format where we have one row per patient, or we can have long format, which is one row per measurement. You can see this is a row for start MES and MES, another one for start bowel symptom score and bowel symptom score, all for patient one. So we end up with six rows for patient one, whereas we have those six measurements listed in a, a single row when we're analyzing per patient. So wide format and long format, the same data, but structured in a different way. We may want to do an analysis by patient as each patient may or may not have the outcome. If this is our goal, we, if we have multiple observations or data points on each patient, this leads to wide data with one row per patient and one column for measurement but we're often interested in the change in an outcome over time. To make this work, we need one row per measurement of the outcome. And this leads to long, sometimes called tall data with multiple visits and measurements for each patient. The unit of analysis usually depends on the question we wanna ask. If the unit of analysis is the patient, which is usually true for dichotomous outcomes, did the patient die, have the outcome of colectomy, reach disease remission, then wide data is usually appropriate. If the unit of analysis is the visit or encounter or a particular measurement, often these are within patient outcomes. So did the C-reactive protein improve from week zero to week eight? Did the number of sickle cell crises per year decrease after CRISPR gene therapy? Or did the endoscopic score decrease on treatment versus placebo? Or all structures, questions where you use a structure of tall data or pivot longer. So long data. Deciding on the unit of analysis, it's actually pretty common and most common to use long data. And this data structure allows you to look at multiple predictors and outcomes at multiple measurements, like blood pressure, a PHQ-9 depression questionnaire, or a hemoglobin measurement. Depending on the analysis question, you may want to use wide data and analyze by patient, more often with dichotomous outcomes. For inpatient data, that gets a little complicated because you'll have multiple measurements in the same visit or day. So you need to decide up front how you're going to handle 
multiple observations of the same, same type, like vitals every six hours, in the same day or the same hospitalization. You could use the 0600 observation each day for blood pressure, or use the daily average for SBP and DBP, or use the max values each day if that's what you're concerned about. Sometimes you may want to do an analysis on both long and wide data in the same project, but for different questions. So it's often helpful to be able to pivot your data between long and wide data structures. So we often enter data by patient. Spreadsheets encourage us to enter longitudinal data as long rows per patient, and we end up with wide rather than tall data. And so here's a typical from our messy UC data set, now cleaned, of, of six measurements taken on each patient at start and end of a six-month retrospective evaluation. Now, you can rotate this to a tall version where you have one row per measurement, and that is the same data just rotated or pivoted to pivot longer. So this is the long form of the data. R and most R functions are vectorized to handle tall or long data. There's one small observation per row, and most analyses in R are easier with tall or long data. So it's very common to pivot data from wide to tall or long on the regular. This lengthens the data, increasing the number of rows and decreasing the number of columns. And we'll be looking at visit dates, start versus end, and measures. The arguments for pivot longer, of course, you have to reference the data you're going to be pivoting, the columns to pivot, the names the columns will go into into a new column, and the where the value should go. And there are many optional arguments. The details from the tidyverse pages here, and hope somebody should be able to click through and see this link or share it in the chat. Uh, data is your data frame or tibble. You can pipe this in. Calls are the columns to pivot as a vector of names or by number or connected selected the tidy select functions. Names to is a character vector specifying a new column or columns to create from the information stored in the column names. And values to is a string specify the name of the column where you should put the data stored in the cell values. So you start with the wide version. We're going to use selected columns from Messy UC. And currently there are 30 rows, one for each patient with six measured quantities for each patient. So you'd predict if we pivot all the measures, there would be six times 30 or 180 rows. And that's part of the confirmation that Shannon was talking about. When you make a data wrangling change, confirm it. Check that it turned out the way you expected. So the tall version we want to end up with, you can see there are now 180 rows and four columns 30 times six, so there's one row per observation measure. So that worked, that makes sense. The question is, how, do we, how are we gonna do it? And the key is defining for the argument, which columns are we gonna pivot? Where, where are the names for each variable going to go? And where are the values going to go? So we're gonna start with the wide data. The code basically says we're gonna take the columns from start MES to end EMO, so our six, six measurement columns. We're gonna put the names into a measure column because it's the name of the measure and the values in, and I'll just call this score, I could call it values. Um, and the result ends up looking like this. So we have patient ID and treatment. These did not pivot at all. These identify each patient and their treatment. Then we have a column for the measure and a column for the score, and we now have 180 columns. So just want to check and make sure this makes sense to everybody. And if you this makes sense at this point, go ahead and give us a thumbs up emoji in the chat or a raised hand if you're puzzled or you have questions. And I, this is a fundamental concept, so worth making sure everybody's on board with this. Okay. That looks promising. Uh, folks are coming along. There we go. Okay. So let's see if we can make this happen. Now, there's one issue with our measure. If I go back and look at this, you can see our measure is actually two pieces of data. It's the time point, start or end, and the actual measure. Um, now, 
Shannon just quickly walk through separate, but uh, essentially you tell it the column you want to separate, what the separating character is, and what you want to separate it into. Um, so to separate that one, we can take measure, separate with the underscore character, and separate it into time point and measure. And that gives you a tidier data set where you've separated the time point from the measure in distinct columns. Now, that's what I did initially. It turns out if you read the documentation for Pivot Longer a little bit more closely, you can actually do this within Pivot Longer with just one more argument, one I don't commonly use, but you can just put in names underscore sep and put underscore there and names to and values to, except now you have two names to, and it's smart enough to do that right within Pivot Longer. So now it's your turn. We're going to use a data set called endodata. These are measurements of the trans epithelial electrical resistance or tear, which is sort of the inverse of leakiness uh, in biopsies, three segments of intestine in patients with different levels of portal hypertension and with liver cirrhosis. This could affect the leakiness of the gut or the tear. Uh, so let's find out what the data show us. So if you can get through the exercises, you can load the data on your home computer. And we're going to go ahead and jump to Posit Cloud to do this and try this out. I'm going to be still sharing. Uh, some good questions about spread and gather. Those have been soft deprecated. I think that's the official term. Um, they are still functional, but they're not being updated. So pivot longer and pivot wider are sort of where things are at now. Um, so this is what endodata looks like. I'll just run this to get that into endodata file. And this is what it looks like. These are the people who one have portal hypertension or zero do not. And these are the measurements of tier for the duodenal biopsy, the ileal biopsy and the colon biopsy. Just for folks who don't know, duodenum is the beginning of the small intestine, ileum is the end of the small intestine, of course, the colon's at the end. Um, and you can, so we are gonna basically work here at this part that says code, and you have to tell it which columns you want to pivot. It will use this names pattern argument to select the things within the parentheses, basically all the characters before underscore tier. So it'll tell you if it's duodenum, ileum, or colon, and then tell it where you want to put the names and the values. And you should be able to do that pivot and get it to 180 rows rather than 30 rows. And I'm going to try to jump back. And can you get this one? So here's the data the arguments, calls, names, pattern, value, names to, and values to. Code basically you're filling in. Um, I don't want to spoil anyone with a solution, but you can peek at the solution on the exercises page if you hit the gray code arrow. And then the result should look like this, where you have for location, duod, ilio, or colon, and then the tier value for each one. And then you can look at who has portal hypertension and who does not. And see if you think that portal hypertension has an effect on tier and the inverse epithelial leakiness. Feel free to put thumbs up in the chat if this is working or comments on whether you think portal hypertension affects epithelial resistance or tear. And in which intestinal segment? And I should have started the timer a while ago. Um, I guess I'll count it down to one minute. Uh, feel free to let us know in the chat if you're struggling or if you're figuring it out, let me know. You've 
If you want, go ahead and go to the exercises pages and peek at the solution. Uh, who I think is from Poland uh, with a thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, Luke's got it done. I'm going to go ahead and got the code here. Now feel free to put a hand up if you're having trouble or need a hint. Definitely phone a friend. And uh, the result in theory should look like this. Go back to the exercise here. And so code is here and the solution. Basically, we select the columns to pivot from Duad tier to colon tier. Um, names pattern pulls in the organ. Uh, I just put location because it was Duat or colon and values to tier. And so we got our intestinal location here and our values here. Um, overall, from this very small sample, it looks like portal hypertension affects the duodenal tier. It's lower, so there's more leakiness. Uh, it doesn't seem to affect ileum or colon, but in the folks with portal hypertension, their duodenal tier seems noticeably lower. So. Little liver factoid for you there. Um, you can also pivot wider. Wide data is a little bit less common, but sometimes needed for per patient analysis. And so you may have data in tall format that you want to convert back. Um, and this is what the tall data look like, as you, we just made. To pivot wider, you give it the ID calls, the ones that are not going to be pivoted, in this case, patient ID and treatment. Names come from the measure, values come from the score, and basically we're doing the reverse, three different arguments, but essentially we end back where we started from. And uh, that can be helpful, particularly if you get data out of things like REDCap, where it's by measurement and you want a patient level analysis, this may be an important tool for you. Um, turning now to longitudinal data, a couple of things you can't you may run into data issues when one or two things happens. You want to analyze data by day or month or year. And most of the time, data in your electronic medical record, like when a medication was administered, is collected and time stamped by the second, not the most convenient time interval. Or you realize that some observations, particularly on weekends, are missing, and you need to fill in these dates as missing, or you really don't want to do this by hand. The patter package can help with these issues. So here's an example of a data set, the emergency data set in the patter package contains over 120,000 emergency calls from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania over a period of about 11 months. 
Each call has a title of what's going on and a timestamp with date and time down to the second. And we want to know in which months the emergency department should order an extra case of Narcan. And it's been suggested that there are more overdoses and they need more Narcan in the summer months. We want to test this. So our starting point is the patter package contains a thicken function, which adds a column to a data frame that is of a higher interval, time interval than the original variable. The intervals for pattern, the options are year, quarter, month, week, day, hour, min, and sec. Sec wouldn't help that much, but you can use it if you have data in milliseconds, I suppose. Uh, the variable timestamp has an interval of seconds. That's the one we start with. We can thicken the data to the time interval we need, and we can count events by usable unit of time. We want months for overdoses. So our original data has these date time timestamps down to the second. We're going to thicken these to month. And basically, the command is pipe it in, thicken month, in quotes. Uh, to make it easier to show, I just took the head for six rows and selected out a few variables so it would fit on the screen. So here's your original timestamp, and timestamp month essentially just pulls the date and assigns it to the first day of the month. We can also thicken to week, same idea, thicken week, remove some extra stuff, and it basically gives you the first day of the start of the week and assigns that so you can graph data by week, or you could do day or whatever thickening you want to do. So we want to do this by month and look at overdoses. So we want to get taken into month and then select and count the overdoses to set up the monthly overdose plot we want. So the code is thickened by month, grouped by timestamp month, and summarize overdoses and basically detect the word overdose in the title, uh, assuming people coded these correctly, and select timestamp month and overdoses, and we get from December 2015 to October 2016, the number of overdoses per month. And if we do a plot, we can see this rise, fall, and rise again. So when would you order extra cases of Narcan? Um, and good question, what's the difference between thickening, just extracting? It's really not that different. It's easy to do it multiple ways. In this case, sadly enough, I think we're looking at March and September. Uh, unfortunately, this is a back to school effect where folks who are narcotic addicted drop their kids off at school and use drugs. And it's a sad statement on humanity, but it is a reality. You can also pad unobserved dates. The pad function allows you to fill in missing intervals. For example, my hospital only runs fecal calprotectin tests on weekdays. So you get these weird discontinuities where you have a fecal calprotectin on Thursday, then Friday, and then the patient magically gets much better by Monday because there are two missing days in between because we don't analyze that. So you get weird discontinuities. So generally no observations on weekend days or holidays. Now you could go in by hand and insert NAs for those days, but is uh, something you can do by padding these with the pad function. Um, and essentially you pad by, and you group it by patient ID. So it's not padding days in between one patient and the next patient. Um, and I'll just show you 12 rows. And essentially it goes in and says, okay, this is the patient. I'm going to put in the missing days and gives you NAs, uh, just filling in the missing data in a systematic way that makes your life a little bit easier. So turning to our third topic, and that's joining data. There's an, this is another data issue you often face is you have two or more interesting data sets, and they would be more interesting if you could link the data in one to data in the other, uh, much like Reese's tells us about chocolate and peanut butter, in this case, data sets. When we often collect data from different sources that we later want to join together for analysis, so maybe from your electronic medical record, the CDC, or the U.S. Census, external data can illuminate our understanding of local patient data and why patients who seem similar have different outcomes. So we're going to set up a problem with two data sets, one local with demographics and census track, and one from the CDC that has values of the social vulnerability index by census tract. We want to know if the SVI for the neighborhood of each patient influences health outcomes or is associated with their outcomes. 
So we need to left join these data sets together by matching on census tract. So the data, we have the demography over here from our local EMR, and we have the CDC data that we downloaded over here. And the, what we're looking for is something to match them on that's identical in both. And in this case, it's census tract, uh, which fortunately not only matches by the name of the variable, which is exactly the same lower snake case, but also both are doubles. Uh, every once in a while you get foiled if they're a different data type because they won't join and they won't match. So the typical code is left joining the demographic data, which is starting by patient and adding new data, social vulnerability index from the CDC data, head on, data set on the right-hand side. And sometimes this is called left-hand side, right-hand side, or X and Y, but the general idea is you left join your base data set, your new data set by whatever the key or unique ID, the matching variable is. So in this case, it's left join demo CDC by census tract, and we get these linked now. And we can now look at, is there an association between social vulnerability in this column and hypertension? And in this very quick look at a grand total of nine patients, it looks like there is, that people with higher social vulnerability are more likely to have hypertension. This is tiny, tiny data, but gives you an idea of the kinds of things you can do by joining data sets. So here's an example of patient demographics with lab results, and this will be your turn to join. So we have a group of patients and their age. We have from data queries from our electronic medical record, we have a set of potassium values for these folks and a set of creatinine values for these folks. Um, through four horrible reasons, they were pulled separately. So we're gonna join them one at a time to these patients. Uh, you can load the data on your own computer with this code here, but we're gonna do most of this in our posit cloud. So you wanna join the correct labs, nine rows from each of the potassium and creatinine data sets to the correct patients. Unique identifier called unique ID or key or record ID is PAP for patient ID, underscore ID. It only occurs once for each patient or row. It appears in each table we want to join, and it's of the same type in each, the data type. Um, you can sometimes get foiled if they look the same but don't match. We want to start with demographics. That'll be our left-hand side or X data set, then add data sets that match, to the right. So we use demo as our base data set on the left-hand side and first join the potassium results on the right-hand side. And this is what's called a mutating join. So new variables from the Y data set, the new data set, are created and added to the left-hand side, the base data set, when there is a match. The ones that don't match are eliminated. And for row three, which has no match, an NA is inserted. So we can do this on Posit Cloud. We're going to exercise PH2. Uh, take a shot at this. I will actually start the timer on time. And let's go take a peek at Posit Cloud. So let me see if I can find PH2 a little bit farther down. You'll have to scroll pretty far down to get the PH2. Sorry about that. So you can load the data by just running this first set, which will load all three data sets. Um, and we want to join the labs. And the code should be data X, data Y by your unique ID. In this case, it's demo to potassium. And we want this to result in the data frame new data. And when you get this sorted, just give us a thumbs up in the chat. Um, and hopefully that's not too hard to figure out your two data sets and the unique ID. And we're just adding the potassium data set at this point. If you want to jump ahead, we can then, as a secondary part, add creatinine down here. So Luke and Atu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Have thumbs up. 
And important to remember, you want to have quotes around this by variable, your unique ID. Um, a little bit unusual. So it's one that I, not that, I, I get foiled by that one fairly often, to be fair. Um, and it's always annoying, but um, it's by equals and then in quotes. Other folks having trouble getting it done, moving ahead to creatinine, just let us know in the chat. Um, the result should link all of these patients and their ages to the creatinine column. And as we're at 132, I'll go ahead and show you the code. You can just jump in and it's demography, potassium by, in this case, patient ID in quotes, pat underscore ID. And that should give you the patient's link to their potassium levels. So our next one, and you can continue in Posit Cloud, we're taking new data and then adding creatinine to produce new data too. And the key is to pick the right unique ID and end up with age, potassium, and creatinine all linked. Um, anybody struggling, please raise a hand. If not, I will. Continue to charge forward. We got a thumbs up from Sneha. All right. So I'll show you the code and it's not too different. We're off joining new data, which we created with creating again by patient ID. You get new data too. And now we have a complete data set and we can look at who are the patients who have high potassium and questionable creatinine levels. Al, is somebody with hypertension and diabetes. So he's got early renal failure at age 44. Antoine is surprising is that he's only 27, but he's got bad looking potassium and creatinine. And he unfortunately has early stage focal sclerosing glomerulosclerosis. So we can identify folks with problems by linking data from different places and start looking at interesting things like outcomes. So left join is generally your workhorse join. You generally start with the patients you want to study and add data to the right side. That's your Y data set. And so where there are matches, you will be adding new variables, in this case, the Y variable. Where there are no matches, you'll get NAs like with subject three. Now, occasionally you'll bring in data and need to wrangle and process it and then pipe it in. But if you left join it, it'll come in as the base data set. So you might need to right join so that this right-hand side data set is your base and the new variables are coming from the piped in data set. Most of the time I use left join, but if I have to do a lot of data wrangling and then pipe it in, I might use a right join. There are also fancier kinds of joins, semi-joins, anti-joins, inner, full joins, union, intersect, set diff, which do come in handy once in a while. Uh, all of these are explained well at this link here. Feel free to click on the link in the slides. The two I probably use most often are what are called semi-join and anti-join. So for semi-join, you're subsetting your data, keeping only a particular group. So if I have the patients I'm studying on the left and the patients in the Y data set of patients who've been hospitalized on the right. I only want to keep the ones who've been hospitalized, but I don't need that one zero to say that they're hospitalized. So I can do a semi-join and just say, take all the ones here and only keep the ones that have a match in the Y data set. Now, the opposite of that is an anti-join, which occasionally comes in handy. So here's an example. You have a data set on the left, on the right, you have a data set of patients who have died or are listed in the medical records as dead and you don't want to study the dead people. So you can say, okay, take my original data set, eliminate anyone who is dead, who's present in the other data set, but I don't really need a new variable, one zero for patients who are dead. Just eliminate those and save the ones who are not dead. Uh, and that's where you can use anti-joint. 
So there are even newer fancy joins using the join by argument, which gives you a lot more options, not just equality or matching, but you can have inequality. You can only match if it's greater than value. So maybe you're looking at readmissions and you only want to look at the admissions that happen after a previous or index admission. You can select any, the closest value, closest date, or closest date as long as it's after the comparison date, but within 30 days, important for readmissions. Or only match if the interval or date overlaps or match a value if it's within a specific range, there's a lot more you can do with joins at join specifications and a lot of inequality joins or range joins that are really helpful. And I wanna mention what happens when you encounter something that is incredibly messy. And I'm showing this data set on the left that constitutes a data crime. There is not a single variable in a column. There is not a single patient in a row. In fact, there's subsetting and they're counting, but they're not actually observations. So what should you do when you're confronted with data of this sort, or even worse? Well, there are two main approaches. One is if you can find the person who collected and entered the data, this is an opportunity. If you don't correct this behavior now, this could torture many future data analysts. It's a teachable moment to educate them about tidy data and send them to watch tidy spreadsheets on YouTube here to prevent this kind of data crime in the future. And you can improve the world one now tidy, tidy data collector at a time. Alternatively, and unfortunately, sometimes there's no way to find the person who collected or entered the data. You were just sent it, found it, downloaded it. Um, this is where you can pull out some advanced data cleaning packages made for this particular kind of mess, like Unpivoter, Tidy Excel, which is great for color-coded data, and Unheader. Uh, there's a nice video here in this link to watch about Unpivoter and Tidy Excel and how to use them, and a free ebook called Spun Spreadsheet Munging Strategies for when you face really hideous data that you don't have a way to get the data collector to do it in a data entry in a tidy fashion. So we've gone through step-by-step -step cleaning, stage one, importing your data cleanly, skipping rows and getting headers, exploring your data, removing empty rows and columns, fixing the variable classes and types, checking dates, cleaning variable names, creating a code book, validating for missingness and outliers, fixing bad category values so that the values make sense and are not misspelled or capitalized in strange ways and identifying and consistently labeling missing values and separating mixed values like systolic and diastolic blood pressure and assigning variable labels. We've also talked about letting your question define your unit of analysis, pivot longer or pivot wider if needed, thicken time or pad missing times if needed, join to add new data if needed, and knowing what package to, to use if you're faced with data horrors. And I'm referring you to Unpivot or Tidy Excel and Unheader. Hopefully, you'll never actually have to use them. Uh, but if you do, uh, now you've heard of them, you can easily Google them. They're on CRAN. And they can, with good vignettes, walk you through how to deal with really difficult data messes. So thank you, and you can click here on the slides to submit workshop feedback, which we'd really appreciate. And we'd be happy to take other questions. Um, yes, Beth mentions that these new joins really help with the not exactly matching, but near matching um, inequalities and things that are close are super helpful. I'll also say that if you enjoyed this workshop, please give Peter a huge uh, thank you and round of applause because this was Peter's creation um, idea um, and he organized it and made it happen. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. And I hopefully we've given you maybe a checklist or a pathway to think about stage one cleaning to a clean rectangle and checking each variable, checking each row, checking the data values, and then thinking about ways to add data, whether it's, or restructure your data, which are optional, you don't need for every situation, but can be really helpful.
And of course, we have a few minutes, so we're happy to take any questions. And I got a question earlier, will Posit Cloud be available forever? I'm sure it will be available through the end of June, this particular account. Um, but all of the exercises and the solutions are available on the web page for the course. And I can put that in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, the uh, the feedback link I actually took out of the slides. If you refresh the slides, uh, they shouldn't be there. Any? Oh, did you create one, Peter? No, no, this is a GT Reg one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an old link uh, from a different okay. workshop that never got replaced. Um, so yeah, just ignore that that feedback link. And I thought I took it out of the okay. slides, Sorry. but maybe it didn't go through. Yes, Atu points out you can download the Posit Cloud project. Yeah, um, I forget where that download button is. Um, there is a way to download that repository. I think you can give feedback um, on the R Medicine website. They'll have a, a link for you to give feedback there. So on your schedule, I think. Are there any questions? I mean, I know there was quite a bit of discussion about um, superseded functions. And so that we're glad we could teach you some newer ones. So there's a question in the chat about how would you deal with data sets providing different statistical measures for the same variable, like mean and standard deviation for some rows, mean IQR for others. I think that's, in my mind, I always separate you know, the, the raw data from the summary data. And in my field specifically, uh, in the pharmaceutical world, there's a new concept called analysis results as data. So uh, basically saving analysis for results in a tidy format, which would be like one row per summary statistic, like one row per mean, one row per median, one row per IQR, one row per standard deviation. So that you could then take that summary data and transform it to any other tabling style that you want. Um, I know that's specific to my field um, in terms of like what's happening in clinical world um, or medical data. Do you want to? Have any thoughts, Peter? Uh, I, I was just noticing there actually is a official feedback page, which is now in the chat. So yeah. that is a possible thing. And so Shannon, in terms of, can you explain that? Because I, I don't think I understood the question. Um, there was a question just about how you deal with data sets providing different statistical measures for the same variable. Uh, so like mean and standard deviation for some and rows meeting and IQR for others. And I would just encourage you to think about the structure of your data set and what should be a row and what should be a column in order to keep that uh, data moving to where it needs to go in terms of summary tables or used otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think most people are very comfortable with means and standard deviations, but if you have wildly non-normal data like hospital stays or medical expenditures, which tend to be very low with very long tails with the at the extremes, it really makes a lot of sense to focus on the medians and the ranges. If that addresses the question, I'm not completely sure. Any other questions? That's really odd. That looks right. I'm, I'm trying to get the YouTube link right for. I think that's right. Yeah, we did a tidy spreadsheets workshop a couple of years ago. Yeah, that is right. Okay. 
So the link, um, the most recent link is for teaching people, especially if you have a med student who needs a little bit of guidance on how not to wreck your Excel spreadsheet, it can at least get them started in the right direction. And uh, huh. Jose asks, is it possible to access the R markdown of the slides? Well, believe it or not, I learned Quarto for this uh, at Shannon's behest. So these are actually Quarto slides. Um, I think yes, it, it is possible. The repository is public. So um, if you are on our course website, there is a, I will share. I believe I'm sharing this screen. Yeah, you can see the website now. It's, oh yeah, there we go. It's loading. Okay, so the website. I keep going. I keep getting crash notifications. I, I think I think you're good now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I'm not good. <laughs> Peter, when I go to the link that you shared, I'm still seeing dope. Really? Yeah, it's, but you know what? The link to the Excel uh, talk is in the slides because I did share that early on too. So. Okay. Well, I'm, I think my copying may be stuck. <laughs> yeah, I was just having some pretty big problems with Zoom. But if, are you seeing my yeah. screen now? Okay, yeah. so if you, for the person that was asking about the source code for the slides, um, if you are at our website and you click on this little GitHub icon, it is going to take you to the source code for the website. And the source code for the slides is contained in the slides folder. Uh, so you'll dig into the QMDs to see the source code and again their their Porto sites. Beth, you're right. I've got the proper link which I got from the the website. I think Chris just shared it too, so we should have it double shared now. We should right. be good. Thank so you. So how do you do the timer on the slides? Uh, that is from. That's a great question. <laughs> it always comes up. Was that called counter? What was the name of that package? It's called from the countdown package. Countdown, countdown. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can just pull up the slides in Quarto to find that. We had another request for how to download the um, Posit Cloud repository. So I can try to demonstrate that. Ah, uh, so actually, I've got it. Uh, think. Okay, you're gonna do it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm assuming you guys can see that. So if you click here to go to the our medical cleaning, and this is my version, right over here, there's a export slash download button, which allows you to download the space. No, uh, I don't see it on mine. Yeah, I think there's a different way you can do it if you're in it. Um, and I always forget. So if you click on that workspace, like just go into your cleaning medical data. And then this is my version. Shannon's version is up here. But for my version, I have multiple buttons. I can throw it away. I can move it or export it. And uh, just click here to export. Can a participant confirm if they have that button? No, I, I don't have it. Yeah, so um, the other way you can do that, you poke around and try to remember. Yeah, if you find it, Shannon, go ahead and share that one. because. I did an export from from the R interface, which it would work. And what is the export that you got to work? If you go to the R Studio interface, mm -hmm. and then you go to the right bottom, and you see the files and everything. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, in the you file. Click, you, you click on the folder, mm -hmm. 
and then you have an export and then it creates a zip file. Makes sense. Okay, let's see. Maybe Rodrigo can teach me how to do this. Okay, go, go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So here we are. Do you see my screen? No, uh, we see a notepad. See a note. Okay, let's let's switch it around here. Yeah, if you All go right. to, uh, one level up on your files, go to one level up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, check the project. All right. Then and go then... To more. Then go to export. All yes. right. Ah, nice. You're gonna click on project more and then export in order to download. Right. Uh, you, you this project. It. Yes, and then it's gonna ask you for your local folder computer yep all right so again in order to do that go, um, to the, go to the bottom left you will see yeah so there it is so you are again going to go up one level if you click on your little r cube here that's going to bring you to the home directory you're going to go up one level to your cloud you're going to click on project then go to more and export Could you please share the GitHub URL? Oh, sure. sure. It's, uh... Right. Where's my chat? I've lost my chat window. Just to have you around. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Haikon gave us uh, how to save the chat. If you're in the chat, go all the way at the bottom with three dots, you can save the chat as a text file. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I do not plan to remove uh, this repository, so the repository and website should stay up as long as GitHub exists. And we will update a couple of those exercises based on some of the changes we made. So the website will have updated uh, code as well for those of you who are asking about it. I know Shannon made a couple of tweaks today in the code, so we'll update that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone.